Welcome to the post-election series of Need to Know. Throughout the early period of the new coalition government, I'll be reporting on all the latest developments in education policy and asking just how they'll affect those of you in schools. The last few weeks have seen the creation of a new world here at Westminster. One man left the scene, another arrived, as did another. And already the changes have started with a renamed Department for Education and a new Secretary of State. It's Queen's Speech Day, so what new legislation does the government have in store for schools? But even before the Queen's carriage arrives, I've gleaned some idea of the political direction of travel from the coalition agreement negotiated between the Conservatives and the Liberal Democrats. Amongst 17 specific pledges, the majority come from the Conservative manifesto. These include giving parents the chance to set up new schools, reforming national pay and conditions for teachers, granting anonymity to school staff accused by pupils, and more choice of exams, including the international GCSE. But there are a few promises taken from the Lib Dem manifesto, including reforming league tables to focus on pupil progress and tackling homophobic bullying in schools. And there's one key promise drawn from both parties' manifestos, a significant funding premium for disadvantaged pupils. Even before the Queen arrives here to formally open the new Parliament, there have been a whole range of policy measures affecting schools that will now not happen. These are those things that were announced by the last government, but which ran out of parliamentary time before they could get through. They're now gone for good. So there will not now be school report cards, nor will there be the requirement for a renewable licence to teach. Also gone are plans for compulsory sex education and for a new primary curriculum based on the Rose Review. Another part of the Labour Education Bill, of course, was, was the recommendations from Jim Rose's uh, primary school review. And those too have gone out the window and I can't see those coming back in with a, uh, with a Conservative government. For many organisations supporting teachers, there have been some shocks. The first round of spending cuts lopped £80 million from education quangos, such as the TDA, the National College for Leadership and the School Food Trust. Bechter and the QCDA will close altogether. Given that the government wanting to make six billion of cuts on the day before the Queen's speech was, uh, was to be read, um, it wasn't surprising that a good number of those cuts applied to, uh, applied to so-called quangos. One right of centre think tank is pretty relaxed about these cuts. I think things that people would agree are not essential. So um, scrapping of Bechter, for example, cuts in the budget of uh, the TDA, the QCDA. Um, I think these are uh, cuts that, that are reasonably easy to make that aren't going to have a, a direct or instant impact on what goes on in schools. Will these affect the teacher in the classroom? Well, I sincerely hope not. Including the Quango cuts, a total of £670 million is being cut from the Department for Education's budget. Money will be taken from Diploma Development, the Every Child Matters and City Challenge projects, and from Every Child a Writer. The bulk, though, comes from grants to local education authorities. But delegated school budgets, Sure Start and 16 to 19 Education, will not be cut this year. I don't think schools will feel too much pain um, over the next year. The question is, is what's going to come after that? Local authorities are facing huge cuts. So the school's budget might be protected, but what happens if the services for special needs, the educational psychologists, the social workers go? What are schools going to do in terms of replacing that kind of service? I think there are going to be uh, some larger cuts. Uh, the government has made it clear that it's going to try to uh, protect education and particularly schools as much as possible. But I think the, uh, the, the severity of the fiscal crisis that the government is in means that there are going to be deep cuts. So against this background of financial constraint, what are the government's immediate plans for changing the law on schools? My Lords and members of the House of Commons, my government's legislative programme will be based upon the principles of freedom, fairness and responsibility. 
Legislation will be introduced to enable more schools to achieve academy status, give teachers greater freedom over the curriculum, and allow new providers to run state schools. So there we have it. Uh, the Queen has confirmed that there will be legislation in the coming session to create more academies, also to create more curriculum freedom for schools, and also to bring in new providers to the school system. Well, all the coverage up to the Queen's speech had been about the so-called free schools, but I'd always thought that the bigger story was going to be the, uh, the legislation that enabled schools to become academies, and that will make a, a, a very substantial difference to the school system. The first new schools law will be a short academies bill to create many more academies, including, for the first time, primary and special schools, and with a free pass for all schools graded as outstanding. A later measure, the Education and Children Bill, is planned to introduce a new national reading test for six-year-olds, a sharper focus for Ofsted inspections, and new powers to improve behaviour and tackle bullying. There's a strong message coming through from the new Secretary of State, Michael Gove, uh, that he wants to, to free up the system. Greater freedom for schools, greater freedom around the curriculum, greater freedom as to of which examinations you choose for the children to take and so on. It appears that it's uh, freedom in the curriculum as long as you teach British history and Winston Churchill. It's freedom as long as you only use synthetic uh, phonics. And it seems to us that actually freedom is going to end up being as long as the chain which shackles you to the Department for Education. The flagship academies reform is perhaps the most significant attempt to provide schools with more freedom. Woodbury Down Primary in North London is already an outstanding school, so it'll get pre-approval for academy status if it wants it. With almost 3,000 schools in this category, most of them primaries, this could mean a huge increase in the current 203 academies. Head teachers like Greg Wallace have all been sent letters by the Education Secretary Michael Gove advising them of the new fast track to academy status. What are the sort of freedoms that academy status might offer you that you don't have now that makes this interesting to you? The big benefit it will bring will be the additional money that you get and I think that's what everyone's interested in obviously. I think there are other things too about being able to be flexible about dates and about inset days. There's things like PPA time. The way that works in school, um, well it doesn't really work. I mean, it's hard to manage. I'd much rather shut school on Friday at 1.30 and that's the PPA time for the teachers and the children go home and when they're in school they're being taught and when school's closed the teachers plan. Um, so, so that kind of possibility I think is, is great. Although we await more detail, the new academies could gain as much as 10% on their annual budget. It may well be that this does actually substantially change the structure of, of education to a greater extent uh, than we've seen uh, at, at any time since comprehensive schools were uh, started and made such a huge change in the 1960s and 1970s. The coalition government hopes to get the new bill into law by the summer so schools can quickly gain the new freedoms of academy status. In the next programme in this Need to Know season, I'll be looking in more detail at what exactly it means to be an academy and how the new status affects things such as freedom over pay and conditions, the curriculum and the length of the school day and year. I also visit one of the few primary schools in the country that is already an academy to ask them what difference it really makes. We're fortunate that we belong to a network. Right, yes. So, yes, which does that, provide yeah, us yeah, with support. But yeah, if you're in a completely independent yeah, academy, yeah. you know, governance support, HR, finance, yeah. there is a lot that local authorities do yeah. for schools.